it's Ian Norman from Lonely Spec. Uh, we just got back from the meetup in the workshop, and uh, I'm really happy at the turnout. I'm really happy that all of you guys could be um, part of Diana and, and my special moment, and uh, I just had a ton of fun. It, it was it's the first time I ever did a post-processing workshop, and it's our first meetup, and I hope it won't be our last, and uh, it was just really great having you out there. Um, this video is our whole post-processing session. I hope you can, you guys can refer back to it anytime. Um, and you know, just uh, if you if you have any questions, email me ian at lonelyspec.com. Um, so anyway, here's the uh, presentation. Okay, so astrophotography is all about capturing light. This is the most important thing to think about when it comes to maximizing our image quality: is how much light can we gather. We want to maximize the amount of light that we capture. When we look up in the night sky, we have roughly 5,000 stars that we can see with our naked eyes. Um, and the majority of those stars are uh, about 100 light years away. They're between 4 and 200 light years. That's really, really far away. It's about 50 million billion miles away. Uh, <clears throat> So when we think about the light from a star, it radiates in every direction. And only a small portion of that, a, a very fine filament of uh, photons going out towards the Earth, are the ones that are actually arriving to our eyeballs that we can see. So those photons needed to take a really, really long journey to, to reach our lens. It's kind of cool to think about. And uh, for the majority of those stars, it took, it, it took those uh, photons a hundred years to get here. So when we see those stars, we're essentially looking into the past a hundred years, at least for the majority of the sky. Uh, some of those stars are even older, uh, thousands of light years away, um, to, to the point where if we look deep enough in the night sky, we can see back essentially to the beginning of time. And that's one of the biggest things that astrophysicists are, are doing to try and understand uh, more about our universe. I don't know very much about that, so I'm not going to go into those details. Uh, when we take a photograph during the daytime, we have a ton of light to work with. We have uh, photons everywhere bouncing around, and uh, that makes making a photograph really easy. Our camera can do it automatically. We don't even have to touch the settings. We can set it to auto and go. Uh, but nighttime is a little bit different. There is a much <laughs> finer uh, and basically there are less photons to work with. Um, and when we think about the way that we capture light, we, th we think about the lens. And the lens is essentially like a little, it's a little net to capture photons. And the bigger the net that we have, the more photons we can collect. So in general, for a nighttime exposure, we want a bigger diameter lens. <clears throat> when we think about the lenses of our eyes, we have about 2 to 8 millimeters uh, of diameter when our eyes are fully dilated. Most people will probably have dilated eyeballs of about 6 millimeters on average. <clears throat> when we think about a camera lens, it goes a little bit better than that. Uh, the typical camera lens will have an aperture diameter of about 5 to 25 millimeters. So a camera can actually capture significantly more light than our eyeballs. So it's a really, really cool to tool. It's essentially an extension of our senses. So it's easy to think of astrophotography as an equipment problem. Um, and it's easy to think about the upgrade path. How can I make my astrophotos better? Oh, well, we need to capture more light, so let's get a bigger lens, a much bigger lens. And since we have a bigger lens, why don't we just get a bigger sensor too? Um, and obviously, there are some inherent problems with that. It's not practical. You don't want to carry around a 25-pound camera. Uh, and you probably don't want to spend $50,000 uh, on your camera. So the upgrade path, I think, is uh, something to sort of don't put too much importance on, I suppose, uh, when you're thinking about your astrophotography. There's a lot more that you can do without having to spend money on your, on your camera equipment. Now, I want to get into you know, how, 
does camera equipment really make a difference? Um, these are three astrophotos that were made on different size uh, lenses and sensors. The very first one was made on a one-third inch sensor. That's really, really small. Uh, it had a four millimeter lens at f2. And the second one was made on a one inch sensor. That's also really small, eight millimeter lens at f1.8. Um, eight millimeter, the eight millimeter lens essentially has double the diameter aperture as that first image. And every time we double our aperture size, we quadruple the light that we gather. So by the time we step up to the one inch sensor, we're collecting four times more light. And when we move up to the full frame sensor, we're collecting 16 times more light, just because the lens is bigger. Uh, let's look at those a little bit closer. So this photograph was made on my cell phone. Um, this guy right here. It's a one plus two, cost me about 300 bucks. And uh, it actually made a pretty decent photograph of the Milky Way. It's, it's pretty surprising. Um, 30 second exposure, pretty standard stuff for making a photograph of the Milky Way. It is noisy. This, these photographs, these examples have no noise reduction applied. With a little bit of work, it could look even better. When we step up the size of the Milky Way, or I'm sorry, the size of the sensor, uh, things get a little bit better. The grain is a little bit finer. The stars are a little bit sharper. But it's still essentially just a photograph of the Milky Way. And when we go into uh, a setup that's significantly larger, like my full frame Sony A7S, that's the camera that I have right here. It's what I shoot on primarily. Um, the grain gets yet even finer, and the details in the stars are just a little bit better. But that also comes at a cost. Uh, the kit that I shot this particular photograph with cost me $3,200. Uh, that's a lot more expensive than my $300 smartphone. Um, so there's actually there's sort of a, uh, a curve of diminishing returns when it comes to equipment. No matter how much money you're spending on it, you're, it it's, it's really hard to chase after that extra little bit of image quality. I really think that this photograph made on a Sony RX100, which is a small point-and-shoot camera. Uh, Diana actually has that with her somewhere. <laughs> this little, little, little guy. Um, this, this photograph looks great, I think. And uh, what I made on my significantly more expensive uh, kit is, uh, it, it's not necessarily that much better. There's a lot that I could have worked with with that RX100. And I, I really do enjoy shooting with that point-and-shoot. Um, it, it makes some amazing photos. So this entire lecture is about how to maximize image quality with the gear that you already own. You don't need to upgrade your stuff. Um, so we're going to talk about all the in-camera in exposure selection stuff. And then we'll move on to our demonstrations of editing, stacking, and panorama stitching. So in order to maximize image quality, we need to define what it is. And I think that there are three pillars of image quality to think about. The first one is signal to noise ratio. The way that we achieve signal to noise ratio, uh, well, there's a few ways. The first one is a bigger sensor and a bigger lens. Um, <clears throat> that's the upgrade path that I was talking about. That's the most expensive way to increase your image quality with signal to noise ratio. The other ways to do it with the equipment you have are using a lower F number, a longer exposure time, and finding the optimum ISO. And I'm going to talk about that uh, in, a, in, a, in a little bit. The second pillar is sharpness. We want to make sure that we're, we can see as many stars as possible. We want the highest resolution and detail in our photographs. Uh, we can do that with equipment again, but that's the most expensive way to do it. So there are some other things to think about. Selecting uh, the, the proper shutter time, which tends to be a shorter sh shutter time so that the stars don't blur across the sky as the Earth is rotating, and uh, finding the op optimum aperture for our lens. And then the final pillar is contrast and color, and this is everything that we do in post-processing. Uh, you can find equipment that will produce higher contrast images. Some lenses produce hi higher contrast images uh, versus others, but for the most part, this will be entirely in post-processing. Um, can you get me some water? All right. oh, cool. 
All right, so let's talk about uh, those settings that we can do in our camera. The first thing is aperture. We select our aperture with our F number, and the aperture is the single, uh, it's, it's the one setting that affects signal to noise ratio the most. Um, it scales, uh, it essentially scales proportionally to your aperture. So the lower F number that we have, we have a, we end up with a larger opening on our lens and we collect more light. And that means that we're going to have a higher signal to noise ratio in our images. One of the problems with using a low F number is that we're going to end up with, or we may end up with, more aberration in our lenses. Defects in the lenses will become more apparent, and that results in a less sharp image. And uh, the, the final sort of caveat of using a low F number is that we can end up with vignetting, which is sort of like dark corners on the image. That's not necessarily problematic for, uh, for most stills. But it can be very problematic for a panorama stitch where you want nice even borders across the, uh, or even seams between the frames of the panorama. Using a high F number gives you a smaller aperture, less aberrations, so we'll have a sharper image. But in turn, we'll have a lowered signal to noise ratio. So it ends up being a compromise as we stop down the lens. <clears throat> I have some examples here of different apertures with a lens that is it's kind of aberration heavy it's not the highest quality lens um, at f1.4 we have a really really clean image there's pretty much no noise in this image at all but if we look at the stars on the corner of the frame we can see that they're kind of distorted they kind of look like little birds with wings or like a moth or something like that um, that's sagittal astigmatism which is a uh, an aberration of the lens <clears throat> when we st stop down the lens two stops, most of those aberrations are completely gone. We have no more defects in our image quality. The vignetting is reduced, as you can see. It becomes brighter in the corners. Um, and there's a little bit more noise, a little more grain in that image. But it's, it, you know, I, I would call that a pretty successful exposure. And just for an extreme example, if we stop our lens down a whole bunch to a really high F number, those stars become perfect pinpoints, and the image is extremely sharp. But there's a lot of noise in the image, and that's because we're not collecting enough light. So our ap aperture selection is essentially picking the, the F number where we have the best mix of sharpness and noise in the image. And usually, that's about one to two stops uh, uh, from wide open. So if you're shooting with a 50 millimeter f1.4, for example, if you stop down to about 2.8, you're going to have a really sharp image, and you're still collecting adequate light. That tends to be a good guideline. There are exceptions. Some very high quality lenses, you can shoot wide open. You can shoot you know, at f2.8, and uh, that'll be the lowest f number that it has, and there will be no apparent aberrations. So it's sort of test out your equipment and figure out what your favorite F number is. And I, I've sort of done that with most of my, my equipment is sort of tested each F number. And I'm like, I know that if I use 2.8 on this lens, I'm satisfied with the results. So the next uh, thing is shutter speed. Shutter speed affects both our signal to noise ratio and our sharpness. If we use too long of a shutter speed, the stars will start to trail and we'll get kind of this like, motion blur in there, and, and that's a detriment to our, our image quality. But one thing that using a long shutter speed does do is it increases our signal to noise ratio. We get to collect more light when we're using a lo longer shutter time. <clears throat> the way that I like to figure out what my shutter speed is, is using the 500 rule. Mm -hmm. um, some photographers will use a different number, like a four, like 400 rule or 300 rule. Um, it doesn't really matter what you use. I think all of them are, are a good starting point for uh, figuring out what a good shutter speed is for your particular lens. And that's basically we take 500, we divide it by our focal length, and that gives us our shutter time. So for example, 500 divided by 50 millimeters gives us about 10 seconds. And if I go back to that example, we can see that 10 seconds is kind of a good compromise between noise 
and sharpness. The stars still look like pinpoints, and uh, we don't have a lot of the grain that's present in that five second exposure. Um, the shutter speed that you can use for a lens ends up sort of varying based on where you're pointing your camera in the sky as well. If we're pointed at the Milky Way, uh, like the galactic center, it's a little bit more sensitive to uh, motion blur than if we were pointing at, say, the North Star, uh, where the relative motion of the stars appears to be less, uh, so we won't get as much star trailing. So it, it, it's something to sort of pay attention to as you're shooting. Uh, check your exposures and, and <coughs> zoom in on live view to, to find and see what your star trailing looks like. Okay, and the final, the final uh, exposure setting that we have is ISO, uh, or ISO. I like to say ISO, it's a little quicker, I guess. Um, and ISO is sometimes called sensitivity. Uh, I don't think that's a very good way to describe it. Um, it's not actually sensitivity. In fact, all of your cameras have a single sensitivity to them. And when you adjust the ISO, you're adjusting the gain, or the amplification of the signal. When you move from ISO 100 to ISO 200, you're doubling the gain. So contrary to popular belief, um, higher ISO does not necessarily mean more noise, especially when we're working in manual exposure mode. If you kept all your other settings the same and you adjusted only your ISO, you would actually find that the higher ISOs produce less noise. Uh, this is particularly uh, strong in Canon cameras. Pretty much every Canon DSLR ever made, except for the latest 80D, uh, has this characteristic. Its best noise performance is at the highest ISO, or close to the highest ISOs. Um, the Canon 6D peaks in performance at about, uh, about ISO 12,800, and that's what this example is here. <clears throat> This example is what we call an ISO invariance test, or uh, an ISO list test. And that basically allows us to figure out um, how a camera behaves at different ISOs. And this is how we figure out what our optimum ISO setting is for our camera. And the way that we do it is we keep our shutter time and our F number constant, so something you would use for your typical Milky Way exposure, and then shoot a photo at each ISO. Shoot at ISO 100, 400, or 200, 400, and so on. And what this allows us to do is, in post-processing, we match our total exposures so that those images are the same brightness, and then we can compare the noise characteristics in those images. In this particular example that I have up here, it's using the Sony A7S, which is considered an ISO invariant camera for the most part. And that means that it doesn't really matter what ISO setting we use. Um, if you look at all of those little sections, those little slices of the image, they almost look identical. Um, at ISO 1600 on the very bottom, there's a little bit more noise. And so I know now on my Sony A7S that I always want to be above ISO 1600. As long as I'm there, I'm getting the best shadow detail and the least noise. And it's specific to this camera. If I was using the Canon 6D, which is shown here, I would need to make sure that I was above ISO, about ISO 3200 and higher, tends to show the best noise characteristics on that, on that camera. Um, if I were to shoot at ISO 100, I would come out with a very noisy image. So those are the, our major exposure settings, and that's how we maximize the image quality directly in our camera. There's a few other settings, like RAW, helps us pu push and pull the image uh, in post-processing. And uh, it allows us to adjust the color and white balance in post-processing as well. Um, shooting with a manual white balance, this doesn't necessarily affect our image quality directly because we can adjust it in post-processing. But sometimes it's very nice to have a very consistent color balance throughout the night. It makes editing a lot easier. Um, when we set auto white balance, small changes in light um, and position of our camera will affect the white balance. So keeping a manual white balance is super helpful. Um, and then there are two noise reduction settings. Long exposure noise reduction, I tend to keep off just because of working time. It doubles your exposure time. So uh, 
keep it off for the most part. Most modern sensors on cameras tend to be very, very high quality, and they don't really need to rely on uh, the method of long exposure noise reduction. And then high ISO noise reduction, definitely leave that thing <coughs> off. Uh, that will tend to muddy up your image and, uh, and really affect the, uh, the quality of the image. And usually, post-process uh, noise reduction software does a better job than what your camera will do. So leave that, leave that setting off on your camera. So this kind of leads into, once, we, once we've maximized the exposure or settings in our camera to maximize image quality, then we want to figure out ways to do more uh, maximizing of our image quality in post-processing. And then my favorite method of that is using exposure stacking. And basically what exposure stacking lets us do is control our parameter of shutter time. It allows us to increase our shutter time without having to worry about star trailing. If we were to use a three-minute exposure on the stars, they would blur uh, ac across our frame. But that does let us collect a lot of light. So stacking is a way to, to um, stacking is a way to collect three minutes of light or more, and not worry about that that uh, that blurring from the star, stars moving across the sky. This kind of gives, gives you an example of the differences that you'll end up with um, from stacking from a, a very uh, small number of frames. 16 is, is considered a small number of frames. Um, but if you compare that first exposure, um, which I have here, exposure number one, uh, single exposure, 10 seconds. And it's really, really grainy. Um, just stacking 16 exposures, and it's significantly clearer. Um, So here's another example here, and sort of a more extreme of what we can get with 60 exposures. We end up with an image that is essentially noise-free. It has uh, a ton of detail in it and a ton of bright colors in it. Comparing that to the original image, this final image was made with frames that looked like this. And uh, I think that's just a testament to what we can do with stacking. So. Uh, we're going to go ahead and jump into this demo of stacking, and then we'll have a five-minute break after that. We're going to be we're going to start with a single frame, and we do uh, two basic steps on it. We neutralize our exposure and our color, and then we make some small enhancements on contrast and detail. And then we'll go into the stacking, which is where we stack the foreground, the sky, and then we blend those stacks together for a final image. So I'm going to switch over to Adobe Lightroom here. OK, this is a dark exposure. This is, this is one of my, my first base exposures. This was taken at Trona Pinnacles. Um, it was a 13 second exposure on my Sony a7S at ISO 3200. Not a lot of detail in there. I knew that as long as I was at ISO 1300, or 3200, rather, that uh, my noise would be kind of optimum. 13 seconds was a good shutter speed for me to select. And I was shooting at f2.8, which was the sharpest setting for my particular lens. Um, let's, we're going to go into the develop module here um, by pressing D. And I'm going to give you a little more room here. Um, since it's a dark exposure, the first thing we want to think about is sort of neutralizing it. And that's to bring our, gra our histogram up. If you look at this histogram up here, we want to bring it up so that it, it's sort of present within the graph and it's not sort of squished over to the one side where it was. So that's the first step, neutralizing our exposure. And then what I want to do is uh, do a little bit of color balance. And the trick that I really love using, um, this is in pretty much all of my post-processing videos on YouTube, is I turn the vibrance and saturation really high. And the reason I like to do that is because it allows us to see really small changes in white balance. If we're too cool, then it'll just turn the whole image blue. And if we're too warm, it'll turn the whole image orange. So the best neutral point tends to be where the image is roughly half blue and half orange. And the same thing applies to tint. Um, we're looking for pinks and greens, and we want to find just a relatively nice mix. And once we've sort of Finish that, we can reset our vibrance and saturation. 
uh, back to neutral, and that gives us a really nicely color balanced image. It's not necessarily the most accurate color balance, uh, but it's the one that will give us the most uh, definition between color tones in the image. <clears throat> so I'm going to just sort of run through some of the basic uh, adjustments here. Uh, <laughs> after I've sort of balanced everything out, for contrast and color, the first thing I like to do is I go down to the tone curve. Um, there's actually two tone curves in Lightroom. Uh, there's this one, which is sort of like the slider curve. Um, some of you might see this. I don't really like using this one. I like to use what's called the point curve. There's a little button down in the bottom corner here. Um, I don't know if you guys can see that. Let me scroll it up. Little button here. That allows you to access the point curve. Switch to that. And that allows us to independently drag around all the points in our, in our tone curve. The way the tone curve works is that it, it adjusts the brightness of the image in any given uh, sector of brightness. So in our, we can adjust the blacks by adjusting the point far to the left. That tends, that's the, the sort of darkest section of our image. And then we can adjust the highlights by adjusting the far right. So everything on the far right of the graph is highlights, and everything on the far left is darks. Um, and I usually look for an S curve in my tone in my tone curve. I like to pull up the highlights, and then I'll pull back down the shadows to to make a real nice gradual S curve. And that increases contrast. Um, it'll increase color contrast as well, so it'll actually enhance the color of the image slightly. That tends to be my primary uh, contrast adjustment. Um, sometimes I'll tweak the highlight shadows and white sliders to recover data. Um, so like if I want to prevent the Milky Way from blowing out, I may redu reduce the highlights just a little bit. I'm going to actually increase this. What I see on my screen is slightly different from what you guys are seeing. <clears throat> um, so yeah, this one needs just a little bit of highlight recovery. And then uh, <laughs> so after we, we've sort of enhanced our contrast, we can sort of start worrying about color a little bit. And uh, we, we do some of that with the present sliders. Um, vibrance and saturation are ones to be really careful of. Uh, it might be really enticing to turn the vibrance up super high. Um, I mean, that's great. In my opinion, um, I think less is more, or tends to be. And uh, I think being a little bit modest with your vibrance and saturation sliders is, is generally a good idea. Um, I tend to like to keep it below about 50. I think that's a, like a good guideline. And that applies also to the clarity adjustment. Um, clarity is kind of cool in both directions for two different effects. Um, increasing the clarity can really make a lot of punch in the image, but it can also kind of make it look a little bit fake, kind of give it that HDRE look. Um, but decreasing the clarity can also make the stars seem fi like finer pinpoints, and it'll, it'll sort of... Uh, give it kind of more of an Orton look, um, kind of more of a dreamy look, I suppose. So that's kind of up to your preference on, on how you want to use clarity. Um, but in the same manner as vibrance and saturation, less tends to be more. Don't, you know, don't overblow it. OK, so that's the basic adjustments that I use on every single one of my astrophotos. Um, sometimes you'll have large gradients in brightness, where the sky will be much brighter than the foreground. And uh, so the last final adjustment that I would make, and it, it's very dependent on the image, I probably wouldn't use it on this one, but I would use the, the, the graduated filter tool, which is kind of up in the top here in Lightroom. And what I would do is I'd reset all these sliders for the graduated filter tool, and I, I just decrease the exposure a little bit. And then I drag down an image, or drag down across the image um, to darken the sky, and then make some final tweaks to the brightness and just get it so that I feel it's sort of a nice balance between the foreground and the sky. Um, I actually think this image is great with a, kind of a brighter sky, so I'm, I'm not going to use it, but um, that would be one of the final tweaks that I make. So looking back at uh, these exposures I made, I made eight exposures, one after another. Same tripod position, but they're all separate exposures. You can't do the stacking thing. Uh, with a single exposure. I get this question a lot, like, oh, can't I just copy my exposure a bunch? 
Um, you could, but you'd end up with exactly the same image. So we need to take the extra two or three minutes to make those extra exposures. So what I'm going to do after these, these uh, uh, edits is we're going to apply those edits to all of our photographs. We can do that by selecting all of our images. We can do that with a shift click. Um, if we hold down shift and click on the final image uh, after having the first image selected, that should select everything. And then we can go over to the side here and we can click the sync settings button. And that will sync all of our settings together. Uh, we want to make sure after we press that button that all of these settings are checked. You can click the check all just to make sure and click synchronize. And that does the same exact uh, settings to all of our exposures. Pretty, pretty slick. Um, all right, we're going to jump right into the stacking part. Selecting all those images again, um, you can also do it with Control A if you're working it, you know, with just uh, a single folder. Um, we're going to bring those into Adobe Photoshop and we're going to go to, let's see, in order to do that, we right click on all of our images and we go to Edit In and Open Layers in Photoshop. All right, I'm running a little bit late on my schedule here. I'm going to try to run through this as quickly as I can so that you guys can have a break. Um, <clears throat> this process is going to vary on different computers. My computer is a few years old. I don't know, it's relatively fast, but depending on what you guys are using, um, if you guys aren't catching up, it's okay. You know, I'll give you guys that that video at the end, so. Okay, so now we have all of our exposures open as layers in Photoshop. If your Photoshop window looks a little bit different from mine, um, I'm just using the default uh, workspace for photography. If you go to Window and then Workspace and Photography, then that'll, that'll essentially give you the same uh, window that I have. I like to pull up the navigator uh, to be able to navigate around the photo. And um, there's a few key strokes that I like to use. Uh, Spacebar uh, and Command or Control together allows you to zoom in. And it, while holding that, if you press Alternate or Option, then you can zoom out. And allows you to do that you know, on a specific area. It's, th those are some key, key commands that are, are super helpful. And if you let go of everything but the Spacebar, it allows you to drag with the Hand tool. Um, that's how I navigate around my images quickly. So the first step we're going to do is we're going to copy all of our layers. And the, the reason that we copy our layers is we're going to do two sets of stacks. We're going to do one stack for the foreground and one for the sky. The, all these layers that I, I have together uh, with, with, let's say, copy now, um, I'm going to combine those together for our foreground stack. So I'm just going to right click on all those layers as they're selected and I'm going to click Convert to Smart Object. And Smart Object allows us to manipulate layers uh, together. So we're going to use all the data from all eight of our layers together. And Smart Objects usually take a little bit of time, of time to compile. So Smart Objects are, are pretty cool because they let us use uh, what are called stack modes. And stack modes allow us to combine the data of each of our frames with different statistical methods. So we can take the average of all of our pixels, um, or we can take the medium value, which is what we're going to do here. If we go to layer, with this, with this, this uh, smart object selected, if we go to layer, and then smart object, and then stack mode, uh, we can choose median. And median tends to be the best noise reduction uh, algorithm to use on a, on a uh, a smart object because uh, it essentially gets rid of the outliers. The hot pixels um, that will affect our image end up being uh, essentially thrown out of the data set. So that it, it, it does the best job at noise reduction. So if I zoom in here uh, to our foreground here, we said we have a little, you know, we have some hot pixels in there. Um, but if I compare that to what we had before, you can see a really great reduction in noise. Excellent reduction in noise. 
Um, after I'm done with that, I'm going to go ahead and name this to foreground. This is our foreground stack. Um, and we're going to attend to these hot pixels real quick. <coughs> A really great way to remove these is to go to filter <clears throat> and then noise and then dust and scratches. Um, this is this is particularly good for bright points of light if you have speckles across your image. Um, dust and scratches is a perfect way to remove it without affecting the full detail of your image. Um, it's one of my favorite methods of noise reduction. Uh, what I'll tend to do is I'll, I'll go all the way down to zero on these sliders and uh, I'll adjust the radius first so that all of those hot pixels disappear. Um, and actually one pixel is, is pretty much getting rid of all of them. And then I'll make some, sm some small tweaks to threshold uh, just to bring back some of the fine detail in the image. And you can basically pull it up until you start seeing those hot pixels again. So about for this particular image, about 29 threshold happens to be good. It'll differ based on the image that you're using. So now we have a really, really clean foreground. If I step back two steps, well, actually, I don't know if it'll let me. I guess it won't let me do that. Anyway, noise reduced foreground, so we're ready to go there. So I'm going to turn off this layer with this little eyeball icon here. And uh, we're going to work on our sky. So for the sky, the problem between with, with all of our layers is if I compare the first layer and the last layer that I have, um, the stars move a lot in the, in the frame between those images. So if we were to make the stack right now, we'd come out with something in the foreground, uh, like in the foreground layer, which looks like this, where our stars are sort of blurred away because of the stack mode. So what we're going to do is we're going to realign all of the layers. So the first thing that I, I want to do is I want to make sure that our, our, uh, um, our foreground is not affecting our alignment of our layers. We're going we're gonna to align these layers together, and then we're going to stack them. So we're going to mask out the foreground. We're going to erase the foreground, essentially. And we're going to that, do that using a layer mask. I've turned off all of my layers except for the bottom layer. And I'm going to use this layer mask tool. And that adds a layer mask off to the right side of the layer down in the bottom corner. Um, and with a black brush, using the brush tool, which is B, if you want to pull it up quickly, I'm going to essentially just paint out the foreground starting at the horizon line. I'm just going to try to do as good of a job of eliminating the horizon as possible. And then I'm going to switch over to the mask view by holding down alternate and clicking on the mask down in the, uh, in, in the layers palette, the little white icon next to the layer. And that allows us to see the content of the mask. Uh, and then we can finish uh, filling out the area of the mask that uh, occupies the foreground. And we just want to fill it in with black. And this will erase the mask and prevent Photoshop from using the content of the foreground to, uh, to affect the alignment of the images when we use the auto align function. So now if we look, if we click back on the layer, we end up with a, an image with just the sky in it. And what we're going to do is we're going to apply the same mask to all of our layers. And the way that we do that is we hold down alternate and we drag it to another layer and that allows us to copy that mask to the other layers. And you can see in the layer palette there in the, in the bottom right corner, I'm creating a, uh, a mask on each of the layers by holding down alternate and just dragging it to the new layer. And that gives us all of these, uh, these layer masks. So if I turn on all of these layers by holding down this uh, eyeball icon, we can see that uh, they've all had the foreground uh, eliminated out of it. So in order to do the alignment, we'll select all, all of the layers. And just like selecting files in, in Lightroom, we select one layer, hold down Shift, and then select the last layer. And then we can go to Edit and Auto Align Layers. And this will allow Photoshop to look at all the layers and try to align them together. I tend to like to use the Auto Projection method. It tends to work the best for me. Sometimes, if you use the Geometric Distortion uh, button, you can get a, a slightly better alignment, especially with lenses that have weird distortion on it. But you will end up with a, a sort of spherized image that needs to be undistorted at the end. Um, so 
if you're having trouble, uh, try that out, but know that you're going to have to unwarp your image a after the fact. So auto projection method tends to work the best, so I'm just going to use that. Okay, so Photoshop ran through that relatively quickly. And one of the ways that I like to check the success of my alignment before I move on is with all those layers still selected, I go into the blending modes and I'll choose lighten. And what lighten does is it only shows the brightest pixels of each layer and it'll show them all together. So if I go to lighten, you can see there's a slight change, especially down in this bottom left corner. If I, I'll go back to normal here. So this is a single frame. We're looking at the top frame and if I go to lighten then we kind of end up with a little bit of, of blurriness there. And that's an indication that our alignment wasn't quite perfect there. Um, this is a, It actually did a, a pretty good job. Sometimes it can be a lot worse than this. Overall, I, I, I do think that it did a pretty good job of aligning, so we're going to move on. So after we've got our images aligned, uh, I like to delete these layer masks because we, the, we want the rest of our data, essentially. <laughs> we can do that by right-clicking and hitting del delete layer mask, or we can take the mask directly and drag it to the trash. You have to be careful not to drag the layer, the, the little layer icon uh, to, to the left to the trash because that'll actually delete the whole layer. But if you just drag the little black and white uh, icon to the trash, then that will delete the, the, the layer mask. Okay, so now that we've done that, we can do the same thing we did with the foreground and we'll select all of those layers with a shift click and then convert that to a smart object and we're going to apply the same median stack to it now that they're aligned and that will will reduce all of the noise in the in the in the sky we'll see how that turns out both both of these processes the the smart object creation and the stack mode end up being the uh, sort of <clears throat> time consumers in this whole workflow they tend to be the slowest things. If you're working with, say, 32 or 64 frames, this is where you're going to wait the longest. Okay, so this, our stack uh, is created. We have a smart object here, and with that selected, we can go to layer and then smart object and stack mode, and then we'll do median again. Okay, so now our stack mode is complete. If we look at the Milky Way here, and I kind of do a back and forth like an undo, you can see that it definitely reduces the grain quite a bit. Let me go in a little closer here. So this is our single, like a single exposure essentially, and then this is our stack. So it it made a really big difference. Uh, with with eight frames, it made uh, roughly like a like a three stop difference. So that's about the equivalent of going from like a micro four thirds camera up to a full frame camera, um, just with eight exposures. Uh, if you took 16 exposures, you'd get four stops. If you took 32, you'd get five stops and so on. Um, there is a point of diminishing returns. You only get a stop every time you double your images. So uh, it, you know, in order to get, you, you could take 32 and get five stops, but in order to get six stops, you're going to need to go up to 64, and then your shooting time extends, your processing time extends. So I actually really like using eight exposures or 16 if I really want like a, you know, a really, really fine image. Um, going up beyond that ends up becoming, uh, I think, a little bit too much work. Um, okay, so now we have our foreground stack, and uh, I'm going to call this layer our sky stack. Um, two layers down in the bottom corner there, and we need to combine those layers together. If we look at our sky layer, it's it's pretty good in the oops, I'm sorry, it's pretty good in the sky, but if we look down at the foregrounds, we've kind of got this kind of weird motion blur going on. I don't know if you can notice that if that's apparent. Um, but the foreground doesn't look the sharpest here. It looks like we sort of like moved our <coughs> camera or something. And that's from the, the realignment of the sky. So what we're going to do is we're going to mask back in. We're going to mask our foreground into our sky. Um, 
I'm going to turn on that foreground layer. And the opposite is true for the foreground layer. The sky looks like a streaky blur, but the foreground is like nice and sharp. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is create another layer mask for our foreground. So with that selected, I click that layer mask button down on the bottom corner. It's a, it's a rectangle with a little circle in it. And with that layer mask selected using a black brush, just like we did before, I'm going to just start painting out the sky. This is one way to do it. Um, sometimes I like to do it manually like this. Another way to do it is you can use this quick selection tool. Um, it's like a little brush with a little like marching ants thing on it. And using that brush, we can basically just select the sky. You just brush over the sky just a little bit, and that'll automatically select the sky. And then what we can do with that, that layer mask selected, we can fill that with the black brush that we were painting on with it before by going to Edit and then Fill. And then we can just choose Black and hit OK. And now we've basically perfectly masked in our sharp foreground with our sharp sky. And now we have our essentially our final exposure. Okay, so in my original presentation, I actually forgot one small step right at this point. You guys didn't see this part uh, in the original presentation, and I realized it when I was editing the video, um, so I'm just going to go through it right here. So after we masked out the sky, I realized that our foreground layer and our sky layer were not perfectly aligned, um, and I should have noticed because we were like doubling uh, some of these uh, pinnacles, um, so what we want to do there is we actually want to be able to drag that foreground layer back into place. Um, and a good way to make sure that your alignment is in check is to change the foreground layer to a different blending mode and then kind of zoom in on the skyline and that will let us see kind of, you know, our misalignment. And then we can drag our foreground layer uh, until it's sort of right on top of the original position. Uh, then we can go ahead and switch that blending mode back to normal. And now we have our properly masked foreground and sky. Um, so here's the continuation of the rest of the presentation. So the, the final step is to just crop our image and save. So using the crop tool here, which I think, I think it's C. Yeah, C. Um, we can just kind of grab a crop box in here and hit enter and there's our final our final image so uh, Photoshop and Lightroom talk to each other really nicely so all we have to do is save this file file save and then we can get, switch back to Lightroom <coughs> and it will automatically pulls our edited uh, image into Lightroom so if we compare those two images um, side by side here. I'm comparing a single exposure with our final stack. Um, so let's let, let that load there. You can see that we have basically greatly reduced noise. Um, it looks really, really clean uh, compared to our single exposure. Okay, so for the next section we're going to talk about panorama stitching. Uh, this is a little simpler method and I think it has in my opinion, the biggest impact on image quality, it's one of the coolest things that you can do uh, in a night sky photo. Um, I've taken this on as, as definitely being my new favorite method of photographing the Milky Way. So panorama stitching uh, has some distinct benefits and it has also some distinct challenges to it. Uh, it gives us greatly increased resolution. I shoot with a 12 megapixel camera and it's not uh, very difficult for me to make an 80 megapixel image with that camera. So you know we, we can essentially get a medium format look. We can get resolutions that exceed what the most expensive Hasselblad medium format cameras have. The new X1, Hasselblad X1D is a 50 megapixel uh, camera and uh, this method will essentially allow you to laugh at that camera because you can greatly exceed the quality of, of what that camera can even achieve. And that camera costs uh, upwards of $10,000 with a lens. So uh, pretty cool to be able to do that. Um, it also decreases our noise, um, but not in the same sense that uh, we're used to. 
um, it's sort of related to the idea of downsampling. Because we're creating such a large image with so many frames, when we view that image at a reasonable uh, viewing distance, those pixels end up being so small that we sort of lose the noise in it. We lose the visible or capability of seeing the noise. Um, so it'll come out, you'll, you'll be able to create very clean looking images with a, uh, a panorama st uh, stitch. Uh, some distinct challenges are we have limited working time. We're shooting a moving subject. The Milky Way isn't moving very quickly, but it is a moving subject, and so it'll change over time. In order to shoot multiple frames of the Milky Way, as it's moving across the sky, if it moves too much, we're going to have a real, uh, really hard time stitching it. So it's something that's sort of a, you know, a time, time trial challenge uh, for making photographs of the Milky Way. Um, and the final challenge is the actual process of alignment and blending the frames. Uh, there's a few in pr problems that we can encounter uh, during that, and um, I'll just go over some of the, the the ways that we can try and mitigate those problems and come out with the best results for our panoramas. Um, you guys might be familiar with seeing those Milky Way photos where there's a big arch across the sky of the whole arch of the Milky Way. I don't know if any of you guys tried shooting that at all last night. Um, it would have been good in the early portions of the night when the Milky Way is fairly low on the horizon and you can see the arch in front of you. As the night progressed, the Milky Way sort of raised up above our heads and that would have been very difficult to get the whole arch. Um, I think that that's a, a, a really great uh, panorama to make. In my opinion, it's the one that has the least creative possibilities, however, because we're essentially just taking in the entire scene. There's no composition to that photograph. You know, it, it's literally just the whole night sky. Um, so what I like to do for my panoramas is, is actually use a long lens. I like to use a 50 millimeter lens, which is a very tight crop of the Milky Way. It gives us a very, very small field of view. Um, and the reason I like to do, do that is because it gives me more uh, capability to compose my image. I, I, I can move around and really frame in a part of the, of the Milky Way that I like relative to my foreground detail rather than just capturing the whole scene. Um, there's a few things that we can do while shooting that will really make our panoramas stitch beautifully. And the first and foremost is to stop down your lens. I know that uh, it can be enticing to get the cleanest image you possibly want by shooting wide open, uh, but there's some problems shooting wide open, even if you have a very, very sharp lens with no aberrations on it. And that is because of vignetting. Uh, even the highest quality lenses, like a, say like a, a Sony Zeiss, uh, or not Sony, but a Zeiss Otis 55 millimeter, probably the sharpest lens ever made. I think it costs like $4,000 or something like that. It's super expensive. Uh, but it still has really strong vignetting uh, when shooting wide open. And vid vignetting is essentially the dark corners of the image. There's, you can sort of see it on this example here in the extreme corners of each frame. It gets a little bit darker. Um, and if we have too much vignetting, then our stitch is not going to work. We're going to see these like dark lines where uh, Photoshop tried to like blend everything together. Um, so stop down your lens about one to two stops. If you're shooting it with a 50 millimeter f1.8, that means you'd be best shooting at about f2.8. Um, and then the final uh, two things, limit, or I'm sorry, uh, <coughs> make sure that you have 50% overlap in your frames. So that means the, the, the best way to think about that is when you're framing your image, uh, look at what's in the center, a star in the center, or roughly, you know, if, if you can see a star in the center. Uh, and when you shift to make your second frame, make sure that star doesn't go off your frame. Uh, make sure it's just kind of over on, on one side. Uh, if you're unsure about it, just keep your movements relatively small. Um, and then the, the, the very final thing, uh, limit your frames. I know it's enticing to, say, to try and create like a huge panorama and take like 50 frames and you're going to be like, oh, this is going to be the highest res resolution panorama ever and it's going to be amazing. Uh, but that makes stitching really, really difficult. If you limit to about 10 to 12 exposures, uh, you're still going to end up with a 100 megapixel file um, with 10 to 12 exposures and, you know, a typical 16 to 24 millimeter or 24 megapixel camera. Um, 
10 to 12 exposures is a really, really great number to chase after. It'll also limit your composition and, and uh, really make you think about what you're framing uh, when you limit your exposures. So we're going to move right into Adobe Lightroom, and I'm going to navigate to my Panorama Example 1 files. Um, these are frames from Trona Pinnacles. Uh, they were made on the Sony A7S, uh, not during the meetup. Um, I took an opportunity to go there uh, when there wasn't a bunch of people running around and make these frames. <laughs> Uh, so there's nobody in these photographs. Uh, <clears throat> uh, what, how many frames did I take? I took a little bit more than I recommend here. Um, so I, I was a little bit ambitious with this particular stack of uh, <coughs> panorama Im images. Um, so I, I'm going to first show you like the absolute best, quickest, most amazing way to make a panorama, and that's in the new... Uh, panorama stitch that they built into Lightroom CC. If you guys don't have the latest version of Lightroom, uh, it's almost worth it because of this one feature that they added, um, and that is the new panorama stitching method. Um, I'm just going to select all of these photographs. Uh, that's with a shift click again. And uh, then I'm going to right click and I go to Photo Burge and then Panorama. And that's like basically it. It's, it like does everything automatically. It's pretty amazing. The reason I like this new Lightroom tool better than using Photoshop to make the panoramas is because it actually gives us the capability to se select our projection method. Uh, making a panorama, there's different ways that we can essentially, sort of like uh, a world map, there's different ways that we can look at it to get all of our data. Since we're taking what's essentially a portion of a sphere around us, we have to figure out how we want to flatten it out into our final frame. Um, so we can select these projection methods. Um, so we'll take a look at what spherical does. That kind of looks like it squishes it a little bit. Cylindrical looked pretty good, which was the default that it happened to select. Usually it'll try to select what it thinks is the best. Um, we'll take a look and see what perspective does. Well, that kind of like stretches it a little bit too much. So I think cylindrical was the best. Uh, there's a couple things you can do in here. Auto crop, that'll automatically crop in the image. Um, if you're working with kind of weird numbers of frames, I don't recommend doing that. It's always better to just crop it by yourself. Uh, and then boundary warp will, will actually like try and like fill in your boundaries uh, by stretching your image uh, to come up with a final panorama. It Sometimes there's some weird stuff. I don't know if it kind of like stretched our horizon. Uh, so I'm going to actually not use that. So you just click Merge, and it'll work away. One of the coolest parts about this particular tool in Lightroom is that it creates a raw file. So we actually end up with like a 70 megapixel raw file. So it, we have all of our original data. Um, it outputs it to a DNG. So we can manipulate it just like we would a single frame and not worry about uh, you know, artifacting that we would get by saving uh, you know, a, a JPEG later. Um, so it ends up becoming a really, really powerful tool. That's a good question. Uh, he asked, how uh, is it dealing with the moving star? So first off, I, I did spend uh, no time in between my I, I, I tried to be as quick as I could between my frames. Um, but there's definitely going to be some movement in the stars. And the cool thing about the panorama stitching is that it, it kind of uh, hides those. Um, as much as you might think that the movement that you would get by spending 10 minutes shooting this panorama, as long as it's not a lot longer than 10 minutes that you spent shooting, uh, the movement is, is going to be hidden by the stitch. Um, I've never encountered uh, a time, unless I like spent too much time in between frames, I've never encountered a time where I ended up with artifacts that indicated that uh, the stars had moved. Um, it, just, it just ends up doing a, a really good job. It, it's kind of like magic. If we zoom in on this, actually. Um, Are you making sure your levels before you start? Um, that's a that's actually a good question. Um, as long as our uh, exposures were identical, we didn't change any settings, and we uh, 
remember to stop down our lens to reduce vignetting, you tend to not have to even touch anything. Um, I'll go ahead and, 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 and show you a couple, uh, a couple things to, to check. Oh, leveling. No, I don't, I don't do that. I don't do that beforehand. I just, it, it'll, it'll, it'll tweak your frames as it, as it needs. Um, so, uh, Uh, it, a panoramic head will definitely help, um, and they're nice because they'll give you like detents right at like the exact degrees that you need to go for fifty percent overlap. Like you can, it, it it makes the workflow a lot faster, and I think that's the benefit for them is that your sh your shooting is going to be s way simpler. I use a ball head, um, and that mostly has to come down to the fact that I travel uh, a lot and I don't want to carry that much equipment with me, so I just have just my regular tripod ball head, and. Uh, um, so w we can level this after the fact. So now that this is com uh, com compiled, we can enter the develop module. I'll just press develop here. Or you can also do it by pressing D. And uh, then we'll go ahead and just do our crop. Um, I've got this locked, so I'm going to unlock the crop with this little lock icon. And we'll just crop it in. It does look a little tilted. Um, there's a couple ways of doing that. We just use the angle tilt if we want to adjust it. And then I'll go ahead and finish the crop. You can also adjust your, your angle um, of the crop by kind of bringing your mouse off to the corner, the outside corner of the crop, and then dragging and, and rotating. Hit enter, and here's our Final image, and now this image is ready to do our our basic adjustments. Um, if I just like run th through those real quickly, our exposure is pretty balanced. Uh, I'll get my white balance; it's a little bit cooler here, so I'll just adjust that. This is these are the same settings that I was using last time. Um, I'll go to the tone curve and kind of bring out some contrast in our image. Uh, I really want to bring up the shadows in particular. <coughs> A little bit of clarity, and uh, and then we'll bring some color back into our image as well. Uh, little treat trick that I like to use: the the light pollution was particularly heavy on this night that I was shooting. Um, I think there was a lot of haze over Barstow, um, so I got a really bright orange glow, which can be uh, can be pretty satisfying actually. It gives it sort of a sunsetty look, um, but I don't necessarily like the hue, uh, like the color uh, of it. So um, if you scroll down on the, the, the tools palette here and, and we go to um, the HSL color black and white thing and we select HSL and then click all, that'll give us all of our hue, saturation, and luminance uh, uh, adjustments. And I like to use this, this, little, uh, this little like target icon here and it says adjust hue by dragging in the photo. Um, this is a really cool thing in, in Lightroom. Click that. And that allows us to, to go out onto the photo itself. And we can just click on, if I click on this yellow area and I drag up and down, it allows me to change the color of just the light pollution. Um, so it, it started off as kind of this like kind of very dull yellow. Um, and I want it to look a little more sunsetty. So I'm actually going to pull in uh, a little bit more oranges and, and, uh, and kind of reds into that light pollution. I, and, you know, just get it to a point where I, I think it looks looks pleasing. Um, looks a little different <laughs> up on the um, up on the screen versus what I'm seeing. But uh, this is something that I'll actually do a lot to a lot of my photographs. Is kind of just tweak the hues a little bit, uh, just to give it kind of that neat little like color graded look. Um, some people might think, okay, yeah, it's not super accurate. It definitely isn't. It's not accurate when you do that. You're 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 messing with the colors, but uh, Keep in mind that this is something that photographers do all the time, and uh, in pretty much every movie you've ever watched, the color scheme of that movie is is essentially completely tweaked. They've changed colors on everything, and it's called color grading. It's I think it's a really great uh, art process to go through. Um, so that basically sums up uh, doing a panorama in Lightroom. It's really really fast. It's become significantly easier to do. Um, if you want to do that in Photoshop where you have a little bit more control, um, if you're getting kind of strange artifacts, maybe there was a moving object in there that you had to deal with. 
maybe somebody walked across your frame uh, and you need to be able to edit a single layer where that person is and you want to get rid of them, uh, then you would want to use uh, Photoshop to do that because then we can see the individual frames and make some small edits to make sure that they're not affecting the final panorama. And to, to do that, we would pull that uh, pull all of these frames into Lightroom by selecting all of those frames, right clicking, and then choosing Edit In. And we actually have a Merge to Panorama in Photoshop. And, and that'll allow us to uh, compile everything in Photoshop instead of Lightroom. Um, so while we're doing that, so when we uh, do a, a merge to Panorama in Lightroom, it automatically opens up this photo merge dialog box. Um, this lists all the files that I'm using for my panorama. And there's a few different parameters in here to pay attention to. Um, once again, just like when we aligned all our images, the auto layout tool tends to be the best. It, it does a really, really good job. So there's, there's some parameters here. Uh, blend images together. We do want them to blend together automatically. Um, but if in the case where you would have like a person walking through your frame that you wanted to get rid of, uh, you would uncheck that and just let them align the images first. Um, I'm going to go ahead and walk through that. And, uh, and then there's this final thing. This is something to, to check after the fact, I suppose. If your lens is still heavily vignetting and you're seeing problems with the blend, where you can see kind of a line where it blend, blended it, um, this vignetting removal tool is a really great way to do it. So rerun the panorama with vignette removal on there. And that'll try to compensate for those changes in, in brightness in the corner of your image before it stitches it. Uh, I'm not going to use that because I don't have a lot of vignetting in my particular images. So we're having it stack these images without blend auto blending them together. Um, and I, I just want to uh, show that so that if you had an element to the photograph that you wanted to make sure like wasn't ending up in your final panorama like somebody walking through your frame, you can actually delete it out ahead of time and then do your final stitch. So as you can see, Photoshop is a little slower than Lightroom. I am not sure why uh, the Adobe teams on Lightroom and Photoshop haven't talked to each other and shared like the really great things that they made in Lightroom and brought it into Photoshop. Um, I imagine it's coming, but yeah, I'm not really sure why they, they, they didn't do it. Um, this is definitely a slower process, but it, you know, if, if you have one of those uh, panoramas where you, you really do need the extra control then Photoshop is going to give that to you. Sometimes um, one of the problems that I've, I've had a few people contact me about um, is sometimes they'll do their like panorama stitch and uh, the alignment will fail. They'll, they'll come out with, sometimes Photoshop will just put them in like a big line. And that's Photoshop telling you that uh, I, I don't know how to do it. Um, the primary causes for alignment failure tend to be uh, exposure and contrast. So if you have a very low contrast image, uh, it can help to first in, in Lightroom uh, increase the contrast of the image with the tone curve or, or with the, the contrast slider. Um, and that'll give Photoshop a little bit more to work with when it comes to aligning the image. Um, so here's, here's our, our final uh, aligned uh, but not stitched together panorama. So we can see each and every layer. If we look in the layers palette, we can see all of the layers I have list, uh, listed out here. And we can sort of zoom in and see some of the, uh, some of the elements of the photograph that, are, uh, that maybe we wouldn't want, for example. So if I look in the extreme corner of this particular frame, there's some really heavy lens aberration. Just right in the extreme corner, these stars don't look like stars anymore. Um, so if, if that was something that I wanted to get rid of and make sure that it didn't end up in that final panorama, then I would, uh, I can actually just essentially erase that out of the image. And, and the, the easiest way to do that when you're working with a ton of layers like this is use this, uh, uh, this move tool. You can get the move tool by pressing V. I don't know why they use V and not like M or something like that, but press V. Um, and if you hold down command or control, uh, and you click on a particular area of the image, 
it'll automatically select that layer. So you have that layer selected. Um, and when we're working with all these layers, it's, it's really important to be able to sort of select the part of the image that we want. So we can zoom in on that. We want to get rid of that. So I'm going to use a layer mask again. And uh, so we have that layer selected, and I'm going to click the layer mask tool. And uh, using a black brush again, uh, I can just sort of paint out that portion of the image. And now I know that that's not going to end up in my final panorama. Um, OK, so we know that this thing actually stitches pretty well, so we don't need to really go through the rest of it. But I, that is a really great element if there's something that you know isn't working out. And uh, it, it's, it's all very dependent on the actual panorama that you're using. So I'm going to select all these, these layers again. I hold down Shift, click on one, and then click on the next. And uh, we're going to go to Edit, and then Auto Blend Layers. Um, there's two different blend methods. We ob obviously are doing a panorama. Stack images is used for a technique called focus stacking. Um, and a really important one is seamless tones and colors. Uh, I think I used auto white balance on this, like a newbie. <laughs> and uh, there's actually some white balance changes. It's, uh, some of the frames are, are slightly uh, cooler than the others. Um, so seamless tones and colors, and that'll, that'll create like a really nice blend for us. And then click OK. And that's, uh, that's basically it for the workflow. It'll come out with a, something very similar to what uh, Lightroom created. But we were able to sort of make those extra tweaks to get rid of elements that we didn't want. There we go. There's our, there's our final, uh, final stitch. In Lightroom, uh, when you're zoomed out, it actually the, the seams tend to be visible. But uh, zooming in, it creates a really, really seamless looking uh, panorama. Does a pretty great job. It's a little uh, satellite in there, actually. Kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. So that uh, that basically sums it up, guys. Um, obviously, I would I would crop this image and and save it. Um, and uh, since we opened in uh, we opened in Adobe Lightroom or via Adobe Lightroom, if we just let me get my crop here. Enter. When we save this, it will automatically pull it into our Lightroom catalog for us since we were working between the two pieces of software. Really, really great part of working with those, those two pieces of software together. Um, yeah, and then it's ready for our, our, our basic adjustments from there. Um, I wanted to end uh, this lecture on, uh, on a quote. And this is the origin of the name of my website. And uh, it's something that really means a lot to me. Carl Sagan, uh, he was an astronomer and astrophysicist. And he wrote a book called The Pale Blue Dot, which was uh, essentially an account of uh, the Voyager spacecraft missions. We sent two probes out to the outer planets. Most of the photographs that you've seen of Jupiter and Saturn and Neptune, those were all made by the Voyager spacecraft. Um, we actually haven't really sent uh, another craft to take photographs of those planets uh, until recently uh, with the Juno spacecraft, um, which will apparently soon be sending images of Jupiter back. But um, that was our first real view of the outer planets, the first time we saw them up close. And um, when one of the Voyager spacecraft were, was out past Saturn, and it was basically at the end of its life for the mission. Um, it was running low on power, and there wasn't a whole lot left for it to do in terms of taking photographs and documenting stuff visually. Uh, Carl Sagan proposed that they use the Voyager spacecraft and to take a portrait of the rest of the solar system. And they took a photograph of the Earth from Saturn. And they came out with this image that's, that's shown up here. And if you look at that little tiny pixel that looks like it's kind of suspended in a sun ray, that's actually the Earth. And uh, he goes on to say a, a really long monologue um, about what that photograph means. And he, he says, essentially, uh, everyone you love and everyone you know and everyone that has ever lived, lived there on that pixel. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing monologue. I, I recommend looking it up. Uh, it's called The Pale Blue Dot. And towards the end of it, he says, our, lone, our, our planet 
is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. Uh, and he goes on to say, to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home that we've ever known. And I think that those words have resonated with me throughout my life. And uh, I really think there's a lot of importance in that. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's, uh, that's the origin of Lonely Spec and, and why I call my web website uh, what it is. So, all right. Thank you. That's, that's basically everything. I want to open up the floor to questions now. Um, if you guys, anything you guys want to ask, uh, whether it's related to photography or uh, our lifestyle, we travel full time, we're bloggers, um, anything at all whatsoever. Are you going to do more of these meetups? Uh, I think I have to now. Uh, the response, <laughs> the response was so overwhelming and so positive. Um, I, I called it the first annual because I, 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 I knew that I wanted to do something like this every year. I don't know if we'll do it at the same time of year every year, but uh, I definitely have one plan for uh, for 2017. We're, we're going to make it happen. I don't know if it'll be here. Um, we were actually up at Alabama Hills, uh, which is two hours north of here, and uh, we were shooting astrophotos there, and that's actually where this photograph is from. And uh, I, I really think that that, that might be uh, the 2017 meetup. Uh, there, it's another Bureau of Land Management land with open camping. Um, the area is a lot larger, um, so there's more opportunities to shoot. Um, I think that that's probably where we'll hold it, but uh, more details will come on LonelySpec.com. Yes. Do you do them on light painting? I don't particularly <laughs> do a lot of light painting. Um, I don't know why, honestly. I guess I sort of like the very natural looking images. Um, it's why I tend to, to process my images relatively minimally. Um, and I sort of like the idea of bringing out uh, those, those really dark shadow areas with the techniques that I talked about in this lecture, using stacking to, to sort of bring out those details rather than just painting it with a flashlight. So yeah, over here. Pacific. Yeah. How do you get that to where it doesn't overwhelm your image? I. Press press I on the keyboard and that cycles through the information of your photograph. Oh, um okay. yeah, so uh you know it'll give you a view of the file name and the when it was taken and the dimensions and Yeah. Um I highly recommend looking up uh Lightroom hotkeys online and you can pretty much run Lightroom without touching your mouse, actually. It's it's pretty amazing. Um, yeah, I recommend looking that up. Uh, that, that'll be super helpful. Are they best taken at a particular time of the year or at any time of the year? Uh, that's a really good question. So the question was about uh, are the pictures of Milk, the Milky Way best at a particular time of year? And that is absolutely true. Uh, this time of year is the best time of year. Um, from about March until October is what we like to call Milky Way season. And that's when the bright galactic center, the, uh, essentially this thing <laughs> is visible in the night sky. And that applies to anywhere in the world from March until October. Um, from October until February, uh, throughout the Northern hemisphere winter season, we actually see, uh, the outer uh, rim of the Milky Way, essentially. We, we're looking away from the galactic center in, in the winter. So if you want to capture that really bright center, uh, shoot during the summer. Um, yeah, that's, that's basically it. The, the reason behind that is because of our position relative to the sun. Um, if we think about where we are in the winter, we just so happen to be between or I'm sorry, on the far side of the sun, such that the sun is between us and the galactic center. So when we try to look at the galactic center, all we see is the sun, and it's daytime, and you know it's you can't see the stars during the daytime. Um, and then in the summer, the, the Earth moves around to the other side of the sun, and now at night, when we look towards the galactic center, we don't have that sun obscuring. We're in the shadow of the Earth itself. 
and then we can look out towards the center of the galaxy and see that really bright galactic core. So shoot during the summer. All right, more questions? Uh, yeah, in the back. So I actually have uh, this filter. This is a very special filter called an intensifier. Um, this is the only filter that I use. It's not a neutral density filter. A neutral density filter is actually made to darken an image. Um, you would use it in bright sunlight. Um, this, what this filter does is it intensifies red tones. Um, it's kind of a throwback piece of gear to the film days when we didn't have digital manipulation of photos and we, you know, we couldn't tweak the colors of the photo in post-processing. Maybe you would tweak it in camera by putting this filter on it. Um, and this is especially great for fall foliage. It'll really turn those like orange and red hues into really deep, uh, deep, deep saturated tones. And the way that it works is it eliminates a certain wavelength of light, uh, specifically uh, yellow and orange light. And um, it kind of gets the sort of the muddier yellow tones out of the image. And it lets the, the brighter, vibrant, uh, bright oranges and bright reds to, to sort of come through in the image. And the cool thing about it is during night photography, it actually, that, that, that yellow tone that it's getting rid of happens to be the same tone of a sodium vapor lamp, which is the typical lamp that you see on a street light. So it eliminates light pollution, more or less. It doesn't completely eliminate it, but it greatly reduces it. Um, it's called a Hoya intensifier. I wrote an article about this on lonelyspec.com. I did a review I showed before and after photographs. Um, as soon as I wrote that article, they sold out everywhere. You can't, you can't buy them anymore. Um, and uh, you guys are actually, I'll be the first to tell you guys, I'm working on uh, getting these things made and accessible again. Um, I think Hoya may have discontinued uh, the intensifier filter. Um, so it, it, it's prohibitively expensive if you want to buy it right now. It's like, there are some available online for like $250 from other companies. Um, and I'm, I'm working on a way to, to source the right type of glass and I'm designing a filter that I'll hopefully be able to sell on LonelySpec.com for a reasonable price. Um, I don't know when I'm going to launch that, but it'll hopefully be within, what's that? Yeah, uh, they're, they're, uh, they're basically on back order if you try to order them. Um, yeah. I, I've, I've talked with B&H with directly, actually. I've talked to their, uh, um, well, I'm like an affiliate with B&H. That's one of the ways that Lonely Spec is supported. Um, but uh, I, I've, I've had them talk to the buyers to see if they can get more. And the word on the street is that they may be discontinued. So if you order it now, you'll go in the pre-order line, but they won't essentially charge you for it. Um, and you might just be waiting for weeks and weeks and weeks. I, I don't know if they're going to come out with any, any more of them. Um, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to make some, I actually, um, I have with me, um, this is my first prototype right here. Uh, looks like a pretty benign piece of glass, but this is the right type of glass for it. And, um, I still have to do some testing, uh, and work out the actual specs of the design, but I hope to be able to post this on, on lonelyspec.com, um. So I'll post it. It'll go on pre-order probably. Um, I, need, I need to make a minimum order quantity with the company that I'm ordering from. So I'm going to probably have like sort of like a Kickstarter style thing campaign where we'll, we'll try to get the minimum amount of pre-orders and it'll help us meet the price that we want. Uh, and if we can meet that, then I should be able to source them. Um, so I'm, I'm excited about that, um, but there's still some more work to be done there. So those are the, sen those are the, <coughs> the filters that I use. Uh, yeah, I um, I guess I can share. Um, let me. Uh, I want to show you what the Hoya did. So this is the the, the commercial off the shelf one, um, and uh, mine works very very similarly to it. Uh, where are we here? This is kind of a good example, before and after example. I don't know if you can see that. Let me 
see if I can zoom in. So uh, if we look on the on the left side, we kind of have a uh, kind of like I don't know a haze created. Um, that's Trona actually in the background. This is taken from Trona Pinnacles. And when you put on the filter, we end up with a slightly darker image, but it it really gets rid of of some of the glow that's around the the town of Trona. Um, it definitely clears you know clears up the light pollution a little bit. It does affect the white balance slightly. It'll usually make your image slightly cooler, um, but that that kind of gives you an idea of what to expect. Um, another really great example is like when shooting the Galactic Center. Um, this is sort of shooting toward the south again, same direction we were facing last night, shooting the Milky Way. And uh, the town of Barstow is creates like a really great orange glow. And so your image is straight out of camera. It will definitely look orange. You have to like tweak, try and tweak your white balance. But with the filter on, it uh, it basically eliminates that. And it really, the, the thing that I, I really love about it is um, kind of in this area, uh, it brings out these red nebula that are basically otherwise obscured by the, the light pollution. It's a little hard to see here, but um, it, it, it's more of a fine details kind of filter. Um, you could try and tweak your white balance to, to emulate what the filter is going to be doing, but that's going to start to shift your adjacent colors. And it's not going to be quite as accurate, so filter does a, a fairly good job. Any more questions uh, right here? Oh yeah, sure. Um, I actually pulled up a video. So um, I have, this is the first product that I've ever designed and sold on my own. Um, it's called the Sharp Star and it's a focusing mask. It's based off of an idea that astronomers use. There's a mask called a Botanov mask. And essentially what a Botanov mask is, is a, a special, uh, mask that goes in front of a telescope and it has slits cut in it. And those slits create diffraction spikes, which I'm going to show you here. Basically, <clears throat> they create diffraction spikes around a star. So if we look at a star uh, through this filter, it creates these lines. And uh, those lines are designed to shift in position when we, uh, when we focus our camera. So if I open this here. So this is a, a video of me through, through my, my, uh, my viewfinder of my camera using the Sharp Star. So this is what we normally see as an out-of-focus picture. And uh, I install the Sharp Star, and you can see that it starts to make these, these little lines around this brightest star. I frame the brightest star, and <clears throat> what we're looking for are there's two sets of lines. There's an X diffraction spike, and then there's a central uh, vertical dis diffraction spike. And when we adjust those, those diffraction spikes move in opposite directions. And when those, when the central spike is sort of aligned in, in the V of that uh, X, then we know we've achieved perfect focus. So I'm just adjusting my focus there and getting those spikes perfectly aligned. And then once, once I have this sort of visual reference that my lens is in perfect focus, I can remove the mask and continue shooting. Um, so it's a really great way to get that last bit of confidence in your focusing. Um, it also is, it, it allows you to get a more refined focus as well. Um, it's called the Sharp Star. Um, it, it, this is what it looks like. It's just a clear optical piece of plastic. Um, it has some diffraction grating lines etched into it. It's, it's, it's made on a laser engraver. Um, and it fits into a standard filter holder. Um, I, use, I use this filter holder. It's called a Format High Tech. Um, there's a whole bunch of different brands out there. There's Format High Tech, Lee, and Koken. And they come in different sizes. And we sell, uh, the, we sell the Sharp Star in each of the different major sizes, 67 millimeter, 75, 85, and 100 millimeters. Um, yeah, it, it, it works on any lens that has a filter thread on it. Um, some of the lenses like the 14 millimeter 2.8, the Rokinon 14 millimeter 2.8, um, where they, they have like a big bulbous front lens element and a fixed hood and they don't have the filter threads. Um, I don't have a design yet for that, but I'm working on it. Those lenses are a little more problematic. 
uh, compared to uh, ones with the, the filter thread. So that's still in the works, but we have it available for most lenses now. So. Did you do anything else with it? I mean, to me, there, you put it on the, the lettering station, you know, station out, mm -hmm. and that's the correct way to put it on. Is by turning it, do you? No, it, it actually doesn't matter which way you put it on. Uh, yeah, I show in my video to you know with it, me putting it on with the logo app, but that's that's for marketing purposes. <laughs> yeah, uh, it it it'll work in both directions. You can rotate it. Uh, the the spikes will rotate with it, uh, but they function identically. Um, yeah, it doesn't really matter how you use it. Um, they are a little bit fragile, uh, so you know don't drop them on the ground or step on them or sit on them or something in your back pocket. Um, but I do have a hundred percent guarantee on it. If you guys break it, if you uh, it doesn't work on your lens, it's just not working out for you. You can't see the diffraction spikes. It's not working on a test image. Uh, then you just let us know, send it back. We'll give you a refund. Um, uh, yeah, over here. Uh, it it actually doesn't really matter as long as you're not spending you know minutes on end between your frames. It doesn't really matter. Uh, I think for simplicity, I like to shoot my horizon first, and then my sky second. So one set of, one set of frames where I'm primarily uh, focused on capturing the foreground, and then a second set of exposures where I go up. I'll usually leave a little bit of the horizon line in there, but I'll I'll be trying to capture the sky. Yeah, you could you could you could do it in like random. You could like take each corner if you wanted, and then fill it in. And it would still be able to figure out where it needs to to go. So. Yeah, that's actually a good point. Um, there is a really cool piece of software that is unfortunately only available for Macintosh, um, and it's called Starry Landscape Stacker. Um, it's available on the Mac App Store. If you guys have, uh, if you guys have a Mac, it's worth the twenty bucks. To, to try this thing out, um, it really is super good. It essentially uses the uh, creates the same workflow of stacking images and uh, simplifies it, and it does things a little bit more automatically. And I find that it works excellent up to about 16 frames, which is what I tend to like to use anyway. Um, it's definitely a way of 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 doing it automatically. Some sometimes it isn't the most accurate. Uh, and in those cases, I'll usually go into Photoshop and kind of do the manual thing on, on my own. Um, but yeah, I think this is an excellent piece of software. Um, it, it works most of the time. So if you want a dedicated stacking tool, uh, Starry Landscape is great. Uh, yeah, I, I do think that that could be advantageous in terms of, of workflow. In terms of results, it probably won't make a difference because you're still essentially tweaking them all the same. Um, that, that's actually a good point. Um, what uh, he's asking about is um, sometimes when our alignment doesn't work, uh, it's advantageous to sort of manually align our images together. Um, I didn't go into detail uh, in that because it, it, it is a very time-consuming process. But on LonelySpec.com, I have a... Uh, manual alignment tutorial. And I, I, I sort of walk through what happens when your images completely fail to align. You end up with like a blurry, streaky mess for the sky. You're just not getting you know, the, the noise reduction that you want. Um, and I, I have like a, a video tutorial that walks through it. And basically it involves using uh, what's called the transform tool. And we, we, we actually manually transform the shape of each layer to fit directly over uh, over sort of a guide layer. We use one base layer as our, uh, as our guide. But yeah, I think that's actually a good idea. If you think that that works uh, faster, uh, I could see that definitely being a good idea. So. How does that work? Yeah, um, so uh, Canon and Nikon both have the astrophotography versions of their cameras. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah so there's the D810A and I think the 60DA. Um, those cameras are essentially the same exact thing that you guys are using, except they've had what, what, what's called the hot mirror on the camera or the 
UV IR cut filter removed and it's been replaced with a special type of filter glass that um, allows more transmission of what they call hydrogen alpha light. Um, it's a specific set of wavelengths of light that extends into the red region and allows the camera to collect essentially what's otherwise not visible red light. Um, so it extends beyond the visible range. And uh, I personally don't, I have never used and I, I don't feel like I need to use um, uh, a camera like that because, well, for, for one, they tend to be significantly more expensive than their normal counterparts. And uh, the difference that they make is very, very small. Um, they are slightly more sensitive to light. You can get slightly better photos and a little bit more nebulosity detail uh, in the Milky Way. But for this type, these types of images, I don't really recommend them. I don't think they're worth the, the extra cost. If you were doing uh, deep sky imaging on a uh, equatorial mount with, a, with a, a large telescope, that's probably the tool that I would pick for sure because that's where you're really worried about the really faint details in the night sky. And those cameras will have a significant advantage in those cases uh, when taking astrophotos. So, and last question. That's a, that, that's honestly a good question, and that's that's one that um, I struggled with a lot um, until I bought a Sony camera. <laughs> um, something about Sony's they have like this really bright live view in 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 the dark, um, and uh, that makes a really big difference. Now, obviously, I don't want to you know, stand here and tell you, oh, you need to go buy a Sony camera. You absolutely don't. But um, I honestly think that trial and error is the only really way, great way to approach it when it comes to uh, composing with a dark live view feed. Yeah, that's... Yeah, that's a good... That's that's a that's a, a very good point, a very good question. Yes, when you're making uh, a stack of photos, it's very important that we don't change anything on our, our camera. Um, don't change your white balance. Don't change your exposure. Um, a stack should have everything absolutely identical. If you were to change your exposure, like say for example, if you made it brighter, that particular frame that was brighter uh, will be regarded as an outlier in the data set because we're using a median filter, and it'll essentially be thrown out. It, like it, Your work taking that exposure will be thrown out. So it's very important that we keep all of our settings uh, the same. Um, and like I said, we can't just take a single image and try to copy it a whole bunch of times, because we'll just end up with the same image. So we take consecutive exposures, uh, all identical, same composition, same settings. Yeah. All right, uh, thanks guys. Oh yeah, and if, you're, if you guys are uh, if you guys come out with some photos from last night, uh, share it on uh, Instagram or something as Lonely Spec Meetup. Um, you can put it on our Flickr group. We've got hundreds of members now in our Flickr group, all sharing astro photos. Uh, it's a really great way to see what other like Lonely Speckers are doing around the world. Um, it's pretty amazing. We've got just a really, really great, uh, great group of people on there. So feel free to share your photos there and. I, I definitely lurk on there. Um, I don't comment a whole lot on those photographs, but you guys are always welcome to email me. Um, Lonely Spec has a contact form. You can contact me. I try to respond to every single email I get. Um, sometimes it is a little delayed. It might take me a couple weeks to get to it because um, I, I get like tens of emails every day from people asking questions about lenses and stuff. But uh, Send me an email. I'll respond eventually. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.